So uh, may I invite Dr. Vashisht Maniar to please come up on the dais and uh, give his talk on group practice in nephrology, nuts and bolts. Now, Dr. Vashish Maniar, actually I know him as a friend. He's a medical oncologist and a hemato-oncologist trained especially in Germany on various issues on hematology. He's the director and founder of MOC, Mumbai Onco Care, which is the largest chain of onco uh, care or specialists. He's attached to Bridge Candy Hospital, Saifi Hospital and HN Reliance. To chair the session, we have uh, people with experience on group practice. And may I invite Dr. Rajesh Kumar, who is from Mumbai and Hiranandani Hospital. Uh, Dr. Imanshu Patel from Zydus Hospital. And uh, Dr. Kayan Siodia, who is a cardiologist running a cardiology group practice. And of course, I run uh, one of the group practices in Mumbai. So four of us would try to see uh, about the nuts and bolts of group practice. We have around uh, 30 minutes for Dr. Vashisht Maniar and 15 minutes of discussion on group practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for having me. It's indeed a great honor and a pleasure to be, you know, amongst such an esteemed crowd. And I genuinely feel like an odd man out. Uh, we were in the middle of a very high quality nephrology discussion. And pardon me from taking you away from nephrology and taking you to more basic emotive aspect of science, and that is group practice. So I'll predominantly be talking about the scalability of medical practice. What are the perspectives, pearls and pitfalls that I, as a medical doctor slash oncologist slash a budding entrepreneur have faced in my journey? For that, let us define success in medical field. We should understand and agree to a fact that it's an ever-changing goalpost. In each phase of life, we start with a set of goals, we achieve them, and there is a new plateau. When we were doing MD medicine, we wanted to become good physicians. When we became physicians, you all wanted to become nephrologists. Your ultimate goal was to do well in your nephrology exams. You did that. Then when you started your practice, you wanted a busy OPD brimming with patients. You did that. And then what? So the success definition seems to be be an ever-changing goalpost. And hence, the need to reinvent, to stay successful as well as relevant. As the adage goes, what got you here is not going to get you there. The formula for success in every aspect of your academic career to your practice is going to be varied. And hence, to continue that success and to build on it and to reach new levels, something needs to change. After more than a decade of education and training, you decided that now you wanted to become an entrepreneur. You started your practice, filled your patient base, earned a substantial recurring revenue stream. What comes next? Growth or scale? And is there really a difference between the same? There is a big difference between growing your practice and scaling your practice. When you start your practice, you want to grow it. Growth is always linear in nature. It has a ceiling. It tends to plateau. So how do you reinvent or you change the plateau? The biggest difference between growth and scale is in growing the quantity of resources and the results are parallel to each other. While in scaling beyond a point, your resources need to be limited and your scaling of your results have to be non-linear or dramatic in nature. When you scale your practice, you remove the three important traditional constraints of growth which are time, energy, and capital. These are the three constraints which limit our ability to grow beyond a point of time. So how does an individual scale their practice? There are three basic thumb rules to scale practice. One is provider expansion, one is location expansion, and one is partnership. Let's quickly take a look at each one of them. When you are doing a provider expansion growth, what it means that you are a standalone nephrologist having a busy practice. For example, somebody like me is based in South Bombay and I suddenly decide to grow. So I'm currently working out of an 800 square feet outpatient department. Now I want to grow. So I want to take my practice to the next level and have 2,500 to 3,000 square feet of practice. The timeline for that growth is going to be slower because I am investing into my own 
outpatient department and my own nephrology practice, having my own dialysis center, my own diagnostics, my own pharmacy. The control that I'll have on my subset of the institute that I'm trying to control is going to be maximum. I will be having a complete knowledge and control over what is happening in my center 24 by 7. My involvement in the center is also going to be extremely high because no brick is going to move unless I decide so. The capital required to grow is intensive, but it's not intensive enough compared to other formations of growth. Another formation of growth or scaling is known as location expansion. What do you mean by location expansion? You practice in two different geographies and hence the timeline required to achieve scale is shorter because you are now catering to not to the same audience, but probably a different set of audience. And hence the control also are going to be slightly less or leaner because beyond a point, you cannot be at two places at the same time. And so is the limitation in terms of your involvement. The capital requirement is obviously higher because you're trying to grow at the same time at multiple sites. Another form is partnership. I'm working in A, you work in B, somebody works in C, and we just happen to share a common brand name. Fastest way to grow, because suddenly you have five centers in five different suburbs of a city. However, there is very minimal control because there is going to be heterogeneity in how each person practices. There is going to be minimum involvement of A person over a B center or a C person over a D center. The capital required is the least because all you're doing is using a common brand name and to each his own. So these are the various ways in which you can drum up working together. Why is group practice not really common in India or more so in medicine? I think this is something that is starting from the first day when we join our MBBS. Right from anatomy till our final MBBS exams, we are never taught, except for the anatomical table where 10 people were dissecting a body, we are never taught to work in groups engineers, MBAs, the most integral part of their education is group discussion. While here, we always feel insecure if the person before us in the Viva does well, because you've set the bar higher and hence the examiner is going to ask you tougher questions. So always throughout our MBBS, we are learned to be on our own. And hence, we start thinking for us more than people around us. So we are always largely worried about our individual value systems being compromised if you're a part of a group. We have certain financial insecurities, interpersonal issues, you're not liking him, he not liking you, and a fear of sabotage. What if you're a group and he does not get all the income that he gets into the group? And hence you always fear getting embezzled. The basic types of associations are either to have a partnership form, a level above would be a limited liability partnership, and the gold standard is to have a private limited firm. So this is what we all knew all along. What did we try and do different, which probably gave us that initial bit of success? We changed it into what we call is the MOC model, where it formed a partnership, but in a way that there was a homogenization of processes. It was a group of people working in a very corporate run atmosphere with very corporate run ethos and practices at the same time, where we created a common platform for creating and controlling processes, dividing responsibilities, and hence the growth was much faster than we could have imagined in our single lives. The typical life cycle of any human being ranges from dependency to independency to interdependency. As you grow, you would want to become independent and beyond a point, you would want to be interdependent. You would not want to be all alone. Similarly, in your professional life cycle also, initially, most people tend to flock to early corporate hospitals the, may, the moment they pass their DM and DNB because it gives them security of having a fixed pay. Then they feel, most of them feel shortchanged or cheated and hence they want to do it on their own. So for five to six years, they're running from pillar to post. And then ideally, you should start working together and the earlier you do better because otherwise the insecurities of your own mind will start delving into your own mind and hence eating up a lot of your time space. Why do people not opt for interdependency? The first one, you know, why do you need to wait for about a decade to get into this interdependency? 
acute discomfort is always the financial insecurity jealousy of us being as humans as we always are we feel that if there is a senior and i have to work with him he's going to block my growth and progress and the long term problem is that you feel that i'm not getting a leadership position in this company there is no personal growth what are the opportunities now i'm really looking at nephrology as a sub speciality what are the opportunities if five or seven of you gentlemen decided to work together it is the ability to sub specialize you could want to do only renal transplants but as a single practitioner you may not be able to do it if you are a group of five one could only be doing transplants one could only be looking at acute kidney injuries one could only be looking at lifestyle diabetic nephropathies and probably because he's now only focusing on that his output may be better than the rest a financial security today i'm unwell today our family members unwell <clears throat> and i wish to not practice for a short period of time i know that the company or my friends or my group is going to take care of me better community penetration please remember when there are two doctors working together it's not 1 plus 1 it's always 3 plus 2 i believe the penetration that a group can have is massive and we've experienced that where you can actually percolate the bilians of the society by simply being available for them ability to do research now when we started as a group most people told us that oh this is a purely financially derived organization because you're just sitting together <clears throat> and trying to earn more money <clears throat> sorry and research is really not possible in, in an individualistic capacity that's a complete myth we at mc we've been able to create thank you so much <clears throat> our own independent ethics review board committee which runs clinical trials on our own we currently have 24 ongoing trial out of which nine are international trials and in six we are the highest recruiters in the country <clears throat> so a group of like minded nephrologists can run a consortium which does high quality academia as well peer support most of us very often in our lives come across a patient who occupies 90% of our entire mind space in a day an acute sick patient when you have that senior or maybe even a junior colleague who's there to <clears throat> just be make sure that what you're doing is absolutely correct it just adds so much more comfort to your practice <clears throat> medico legal protection when you have a sick patient and if two nephrologists see the same patient on the same day and believe that this is the best practice that we are offering him that's a significantly high quality medical legal protection that you are offering to your own self and when you're a group you are less likely to fall prey to medical juicing which unfortunately has become a big menace of late where your prescriptions are reacted by colleagues in not the nicest ways but if your colleague knows that he is a part of a group of 6 7 people or your colleague is a part of the same group you are less likely to be subjected to jousting another opportunity is better recognition amongst peers and community the fact that a medical oncologist you know who is not very uh, well developed into his practice probably completed only 10 years of my practice is sitting and talking in front of you is because moc has been able to give me that platform to do that so as an organization it helps you reach levels that you probably would not in singular practice however good you are and eventually it gives you a far larger canvas to paint your goals is it all rosy of course not there are pitfalls why what are the pitfalls <clears throat> because five lions cannot stay in the same area <clears throat> similarly <coughs> sorry the biggest pitfall is too many captains in the same team everybody wants to do everything occasionally there is a leadership crisis today i have taken a decision you haven't liked it i will stop taking decisions from tomorrow and suddenly you feel you see that there is a policy paralysis where the group isn't moving forward personal interests over the group my preference over a particular drug or a, over a particular treatment protocol which may may not be ideal or optimal overpowers the requirement of the organization often becomes a big pitfall that constant fear of embezzlement where you are constantly worried that what if he makes more money and what if he does not share is is something that 
is a huge pitfall if i may say so of a group practice and one of the biggest pain points trying to own a patient what happens is sometimes you've seen a patient and the patient lands in your colleague's clinic and you feel uncomfortable with it that again is a big pitfall one up manship where you believe that no i am a better clinician you know what i feel is right and last but not the least star doctor phenomena where when after you finish about a decade of your practice you believe guidelines exist for you know the frail i am the guideline i am level one evidence and that cannot survive in a group so if you believe that you have any of these qualities best time to never be a part of the group because two qualities are extremely required to be a part of a group one is to have minimal ego and that is to be able to accommodate others and second do not have insecurities of practice or money if you can take over these two basic fundamentals away from your practice group practice is the best thing for you so why really start a group practice because it, there are so many challenges in individual practices you cannot consolidate and comprehend services beyond an individual level for example when i was running a day care center i could not afford to have an intensivist on the clock an onco physiotherapist an onco nutritionist a genetic counselor i wanted to offer all of that to my patients but it was impractical as a single <clears throat> practitioner to be able to afford to do that as a group you can do that you can follow best possible international standard practices so sharing our journey here and just throwing a light and hopefully reflecting on what we did right and what we did wrong so moc was created by a group of like minded medical oncologists the vision was to redefine cancer care in india it was an innovative apex cost light system which was meant to improve compliance and comfort for cancer patients before daycare centers came into practice largely the practice due to be either in the large corporate hospitals or large government institutes like tata memorial or small nursing homes there was no fourth alternative so we began with a small single pilot center in ghatkopar testing the model understanding if daycare is here to stay in india this was about more than 5 years back observed the acceptance of the idea <clears throat> while we were doing that this was actually the game changer for us <clears throat> we created a cookbook of processes which we call our geeta or the bible so every doctor knows what a patient wants but never have they taken that effort to write it down we wrote down processes of how should a patient's journey be right from the moment they call to visit the center till they die and we mapped it out into a single book to understand at what level we can intervene to improve outcomes we created a non clinical team of professionals extremely important because we as doctors sometimes believe that mai to md ya dm hu so i know more than anybody else but trust me an mba can do an infra better than you so we very early in our journey we started having an infra team a compliance team an hr team a clinical quality control team an ethical marketing team and a strong tech team and this was in the first year of our inception what were the initial challenges that we faced how do you convince a consultant to join you me and my friend two of us have joined but what should attract that third person to join you should you be focusing on running a clinical practice or focus on running the business of your practice how do you homogenize services across the board what are the challenges in terms of compliance <clears throat> for example in bombay bmc gives you a list of 20 things and half of them may be irrelevant to you how do you ensure financial parity and security at the same time how do you attract or retain good non clinical talent to represent you or stay with you how did we overcome this we realized that eventually two pillars were important for the growth of our practice one was the consultant or a medical oncologist for us and the other was a patient so we designed our strategies around these two goals so we focused first at the consultant if you are a part of a group what does a consultant need he needs clinical freedom to practice the way they want to he needs comfort he needs peer support he needs legal protection he needs good marketing support we gave all of that to the new consultant 
what does the patient need a patient needs the consultant to be available for him so every center has a medical oncologist who is available 8 hours in a day they need somebody who is accessible we created that access they need a beautiful infra which adds to their comfort they need practices which are internationally known and known to be patient safe and at the same time they want the treatment to be affordable being a part of a group your costs can really come down and because you are not a top heavy organization like a corporate institute you can significantly cut cost still make enough money to take care of yourself and your patient what did we do right in this journey we donned the entrepreneur hat and we played multiple roles early delegation of work creating a cookbook of processes frequently meeting each other sometimes in a group of four and you continue doing busy clinical practice there is a strong chance that people start believing otherwise so even if there is no need to frequently meeting all the important stakeholders in the system is extremely important a routine mis now this was the most difficult part for all of us as clinicians mis is a management information software which throws your numbers back at you it makes you realize whether what you're doing is right optimal suboptimal in terms of your clinical outcomes in terms of the time that you spend at various places and we realized that a good amount of our time was being spent in efforts which were not really fruitful either for us or for the organization what did we not do right very important <clears throat> again don the entrepreneurs hat <clears throat> all of us very early into the company's journey thought that i could take better decisions when it came to infrastructure than somebody who's who has better technical knowledge i thought i could do a better hr policy than somebody who has done an mba in hr and we who created the organization eventually became the roadblocks of the organization itself and a big promise that we made to ourselves 5 years back that in 5 years we'll start doing sub specialties which is dmgs disease management groups again something that i believe we still haven't been able to achieve so that's a big uh, red dot you know on what we have done so far a very important part of what we've been able to do is to create a very strong non clinical team and that's the organogram for it you need to have a board you need to have an operations officer there is an hr there is a marketing guy there is a clinical operations guy there is a project head there is an it head there is a financial operations planning budgeting capital management team there's a qc team which is focuses on are you doing your dialysis well is your outcome same are your fistulas getting blocked and at the same time reporting it and comparing it to international standards each of us at the board took individual responsibilities which were not really getting into each other's domain so you were not having leaders who were walking into each other's work or they were all working in the same direction we created a clinical governing body which looked at clinical research quality control practice education and training again these things look very far fetched for a group of small individuals to do it but trust me you very well can you can train so we have a training center for nurses we have a training centers for rmos if anybody wants to get into a tata to do a research program they can get a certified training with us this was the biggest pain point as i started my conversation with how do you attract or retain talent so we created what is called as the moc buddy program which was focused on orienting engaging communicating and facilitating so when you join moc you just don't join moc as an individual but throughout your journey you are attached to a senior onco physician who is going to hand hold you who is going to be your 9 pm friend for non oncology related queries as well who is going to ensure that he takes care of you like an elder brother or a sister in your journey and sometimes it is that hand holding which all of us need sometimes the reason we come together or we do not come together we believe is money but i strongly believe that all of us have chosen to be doctors and hence finance never guides what we do when we hear people shifting hospitals because they've got a better pay that's a myth they shift hospitals because the mba in that hospital is being nasty to them but we are projected as if we are chasing numbers what have we done in the last 6 months the reason i put this slide because this is something that we've discussed yesterday night at 12 o'clock in board meeting and i found it very interesting we now have 
three new positions. We have a business analyst. We have a revenue assurance manager. Now, when you're running a daycare center or if you're running a program which has overheads or which has consumables and you have insurances, you need to get your money back. So we have now appointed a person whose only job is to get your money back. You know, you could be attached to five different hospitals and none of them are paying you on time. We've got a financial controller now who ensures the frugality of what we do and ensures that processes are extremely hygienic. What does the employee have in it us have in it to stay with us? Why shouldn't they work for a large corporate organization? Because we have employee insurance schemes, we have provident fund, bonuses, anniversary events, all of our employees are checked with a free memo, pap smear, free vaccination, and people who we feel have contributed are offered ownership. They need not be an oncologist. You could be a chemotherapy nurse, but if the organization believes that you genuinely care and you've been working hard, you are given shares in the company. So the sense of ownership is immense. What we realized in individual capacities, <clears throat> our attrition rate was about 30%. The moment we started working together as a group, the attrition rate has gone down to less than 5%. Why? Because now you're creating micro centers, which it's like having a small state. Isn't it better organized? Isn't it better? The output is far better. The quality of service is far better. Pricing is better. Flexibility is better. And it's not faceless. What can the nephrologists learn? I think this is really my take home slide. To identify yourself if you can be or should be a part of a group practice. Number one is you need to identify your horizon. As I mentioned, horizons are dynamic. If you feel that what you're doing is absolutely optimal and you don't want to rock the boat, getting into group practice is not a good idea at all. Assess your personality. Can you work with your colleagues? I had this experience long back, five years back, when I approached a senior colleague of mine, a very good friend, and I said, why don't you join us? And he said, I love you guys, but I, as a person, am a control freak. I find it very difficult to delegate. I find it very uncomfortable to share patients. Then if you are those types, group practice is absolutely not for you. So this is very important to assess yourself before you commit to be a part of a group of people. Come together early. If you feel that there are three, four, five of y'all who you want to work together, don't create timelines where we'll work next Diwali, we'll wait for two years, wait for my children to grow up. No, that's not a good idea address each other's concerns prior to joining. Write down everything. No dosti, no yari, do the paperwork right. List down your concerns on paper. Be honest enough to share it with each other because if you can't share it now and you sign the papers, you're only going to make matters worse. And it's like getting into a marriage without loving each other. Chalk out roles and responsibilities upfront. Extremely essential. If you have four people and all the four of you all want to do the same thing and nobody wants to do the rest, your organization is not going to move forward. There are certain roles which is going to give you a lot of visibility. There are others which only satiate your need to do better. There are some which give you nothing, but they do a lot for the Institute. So have the humility to accept the role which the Institute or a group needs and not you alone. What has kept us going so far? It are these MIS meetings, you know, they all cause a lot of butterflies when we're about to meet because we as doctors are not used to looking at our numbers. I don't want to know how many outpatients I've seen last month. I feel it's a very corporate way to look at things, but trust me, it isn't. It's only a reflection of what you're doing and whether you're doing it right. Administration meetings, a lot of rewiring, a lot of heated arguments, sometimes the best opinion is given by you know a level four clerk working in an institute be open to ideas ensure that your staff is all the time motivated and they're educated with the best practices constant cmes and tumor boards form a very integral part of what we do has it been easy the answer is absolutely no a lot of human resource time investment paperwork government permissions but in the end of it all this tremendous peace of mind 
when I'm here today, I have patients admitted in five hospitals in Bombay, and I know they've been looked after as well as I would see them. There is distribution of liability. I have two sick patients in two hospitals. I know that my colleagues are covering me up for giving them the best possible care. I'm financially secure. I may not work for the next three weeks and still draw the same paycheck. And there is a tremendous value addition when you're a group of people along with each other. Our journey over the last five years, the reason I'm sharing these numbers is because I believe if we can, you all can do it probably much better because nephrology like oncology can work outside the ghettos of large apical institutes. We were four of us who joined five years back. Today we are 21. We had four centers. Today we have 13. We have three outreach OPDs. We are in seven cities. We, about, we see about 9,500 new cancer patients a year and we do about 28,000 chemotherapy infusions a year. So we strongly believe that the reason I'm genuinely here and the reason I, uh, you know, when Dr. Umesh Khanna sir asked me to come and speak, I was very keen because I hope at the end of the day, tomorrow morning, a few of you could be sitting on a breakfast table discussing why don't we sit together and work together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vashisht. Um, I'm sure there are uh, going to be a lot of meetings tomorrow morning at the breakfast table. Um, my main worry is you still made it the way MOC is today becomes still a formidable target for some of us sitting in the audience. Maybe the first one or two years, if you could probably give some advice to a first year resident and a 15 year senior sitting here as to how uh, they could approach group Absolutely. practice, not the details, but yes, no. So I'm reiterating. So I mean, the... basically it's the ownership of the junior and the insecurity of the senior. These two are, are the retention of the junior and the insecurity of the senior. These two probably are the most important areas which need to be covered. So any. Absolutely. So points. again, reiterating to the statement that I made, the 15 year old senior has to leave behind his ego. He has to leave behind his ownership of patients. He should be able to get up and offer his chair to his junior colleague. That is often lacking. And if you are not a person who can do that, group practice is not for you. For a junior, their biggest fear, anxiety, is that I will be working under this star doctor phenomena and I will only always be considered as his assistant or as his colleague. What we have done to mitigate that problem is that junior consultant's name is usually written over the senior consultant's name in the new prescription that comes in. By giving them that place holding, we make a statement that you're not working for me, you're working with me. They are never ever told or reminded that they're junior consultants. They're always labeled across in all lingos, official and unofficial paperwork as colleagues. So there is no hierarchy which is there in the system. The moment the 15 year old person in his practice is able to swallow his pride and believe that he's my friend and colleague, he'll make a fantastic partner to be a part of group practice. So we have uh, three colleagues with us who also have experience of group practice. We will take comments from all three of them and then throw the uh, questions from the audience. We'll take them. Rajesh has been in group practice, is in group practice, has seen some of the issues of group practice and has again thought that group practice is still required, which is why he's still in group practice. So need to know from him what are more importantly, why some group practice doesn't reach the level of satisfaction. We all know the advantages. There's no point in repeating the same, but why the group practices fail in your experience? So we have got experience of almost 15 years. We are completing 15 years of group practice. We have started with five nephrologists. One of the nephrologists has left. And we are still having love, love. four nephrologists working and doing what we wanted to do at the beginning. You have covered every aspect of what we did in last 15 years. You have covered whatever is required for group practice, no ego, having a common platform, discussion. Every week used to meet. Before starting Apex Kidney Care, three years without having money in pocket, we used to meet at 
cafe coffee day in dadar and just discussing what way we can start this journey and we have started in 2009 you have covered every aspect so i don't have to tell sir because uh, we have found the same thing after few years when the company has start having a success you will have some talk of uh, how to make more money how to make more revenue how to do much much more than what we are doing you have not done your mba but you do you feel that you are having a better uh, business mind as compared to a mba no no sir not at all <laughs> but you are still doing so well so, so that things was there in when we are uh, after 10 years of our company we have started thinking of making this structure is a corporate structure we should have a ceo you should have a ceo like you have discussed yesterday night that you should have a financial controller this that these are the journey these are the journey every company happen to do that after 5 years 10 years when the money start coming up you can spend more money on that okay. so that is my thing so i think the corporate part is what both of you all have a lot of experience on i need somebody to tell little lower level of you know so, group practice you will reach the corporate yeah when so sir so we started as four people sitting in a cafe coffee day we very similar journey bootstrapped spend our own money it is the ability to invest in your dream is also very important right sometimes what happens is you feel that you know group practice theek hai lekin mera paisa mere paas aana chahiye it is the ability of the senior to take home lesser than what you are making every day to make that group practice successful if it is going to be a corporate existence ki if you're earning 10 and everybody is going to take home at the end of the day 10 rupees and there is nothing left in your kitty you're not going to grow shall i understand that it's more to do with the seniors giving up a part of it for the success or there is something for the juniors also to change yes for and, the success of the group practice right and, now and, i think what i have understood is that the seniors have to yeah and give more than the juniors have to and so juniors level. also have to have that faith that this person is going to take care of me for the next 5 years 7 years that faith is extremely essential if that insecurity is there you will never be working wholeheartedly are there some juniors in the audience who have their own fears and would want some comment you are too junior for that question junior is me junior is me yeah so he is the junior he wants some comments because it's easy for Ask so, to talk of. Let's hear from them. Yeah. So immediately after DM, I joined a group practice because there were two contentions with me. First and foremost, uh, like the foreign countries, our practice, especially in our city, is not institutional based. It is private based. And as juniors coming up, it's difficult. Yes, I'm being selfish where that's concerned. Fair enough. Number two was the medical legal implications, which were, you know, attached to every intervention branch that we were there in. especially being interventional cardiologist and you know patients coming up every day with litigation this was something these two points actually got our attention and uh, i'll be frank somebody who is 10 years senior to me we started the group when i was 10 years junior to him and now we were two of us now we are five of us in 6 years so it's been quite a big journey himanshu your take on it he's also got tremendous experience sir. yeah i have a experience of around, around 20 years and uh, in fact i have a pleasant i had a pleasant journey of uh, group practice uh, we were six nephrologists together but the most important thing which i want to convey is that if you want to start a group practice start in the early age because that is the age where you are flexible after 50 it is not a good take to have a good group practice yeah. first so I thing is all mine is it yeah you, you so get no, ossified like that, you get ossified it depends it's difficult because rigidity sets in second rigidity. part second part is whenever you start thinking of group practice please uh, decide the rules of separation first because that is I the was, most important thing absolutely. because absolutely. exit plan western if you are marriage, not the western marriage yeah 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 so that is a very very important thing and the third thing that i would suggest that for a junior uh, as he said that his name should be in the uh, the list the upper upper part and the second thing is that his growth should be given or on paper from the beginning 
because if you say i will decide after two years right. whether you should be growing or you should be giving some challenges and you should define the growth also so what we i have practiced is something called a gajar danda theory i have a carrot in front and the, we have a danda on the back so everybody has to run and it should be and pleasantly we had a uh, we have dissolved our group and my another take of message is that at average age of 50 if total partners whatever average is 50 they should dissolve the partnership and rebuild the partnership because after that everybody has their own thinking process somebody has a continuous zeal somebody has laid back somebody's son has gone to us somebody's son is in engineering college so there are differences in the do you believe in the it? zeal so i think it. this is what important I, point so your yeah. take on it so sir we should build this into the system on the first day so a completely important point which i have missed was the exit Exit. exit death disability should be built as a part of your system we have a we have dissolved our group and still we are meeting every yeah. three monthly for a dinner so yeah. that is yeah. what we wanted one junior and then these two seniors one junior please yeah akash who is the junior me <laughs> no no i uh, dr mani i like the concept of ego in your uh, the, the skin, uh, partnership. I noticed something interesting. I went through your profile, MOC, on website. Interesting, many of them are from Gujarat Cancer Center. It does make a difference training it in does a particular a place. And that is, uh, you've done it wantonly, yeah. that coming from the same center, so the thought process yes. is the same. So, so the first six were from the same center. Now we have people from, but probably because we were from the same center, taught in the same unit, in the same hospital, the thinking was very, very similar. And that probably was the glue which okay. bound the first four or five of us together. Now we have people from uh, academic institutes in Adia, Rajiv Gandhi, Tata Memorial, Ames, we're all I working. Saw. But you're right, sir. A fantastic observation. The other other point uh, is also what you said about uh, the colleagues having the uh, you know the personality. I attended a business school meeting. They said uh, different personality. Some are fit only for front office. Like that, maybe uh, assessment before doing that. And maybe... Astrologer consultation, look at astrology, I don't know. Thank you. So I will tell you, sir, very honestly, we have a pro forma that every individual fills and then there is an assessment done to find out what is his niche in terms of his ability to deliver. And uh, that is a part of the KRA of that person. Because sometimes I believe I'm very good at this, but my assessment uh, reels otherwise. And I, have that, I should have that honest mirror in front of me that no, you're good at this. So it's ability to accept, which is very important. We have just one, one and a half minute, Akash, and then one sh very short comment from you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Vashish. You've always been an inspiration. But, uh, sir, we all made a point that the senior has to give up. The senior has to lose. Yeah, please. I will do give you, up. Yeah, don't worry. Do, do you, sir, my point is, do you actually even lose? No, I no. don't think you do because so, you end up making up much more. Yeah, it's it's you don't end up making up losing much more. You end up getting much more for the less amount of time that you spend in. And uh, I think you will probably agree with that, and you probably so, will too. Akash, I'll complete the statement. You need to lose in the initial period, which is ah, the most toughest yeah. thing to do for a human being. Correct. Everybody knows the end of the day. Everybody is going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Correct. Yeah, I think last thirty seconds from Ashish. Yeah. I am the part of a, a group which is there for last four decades. Dr. Rana is not here. I am speaking on his behalf. And uh, Dr. Vishish, your lecture was a deja vu for me. Few things which I would like to add. First of all, what you were saying about junior uh, and one senior, I think you leave that thing. Okay. You should not consider that he is a junior when he is part of your group, he is your colleague. Be benevolent. Give them a comfort zone, treat them as your uh, colleagues, and you should be judicious in uh, settling the financial matters. And it should be rational. I think and it should, should be, be pointed it should be changed <laughs> from time to time. I think this will make your group very stable. And we are, four of us here, still we are not worried that our patients will be taken care of. Thank you, so you have to not uh, discuss the uh, a time where you are breaking the group. I no. think you can keep the group for years, decades. Sure. Thank you.
Thank you. Dr. P.P. Verma, if we'll be delayed for the drink and dinner, it'll be because of Dr. Manjusha. She sorry, wants one sorry. I'll not take much time. It was a wonderful uh, talk. And uh, what I wanted to ask is, how is the involvement of women in group practice? Oh. Is it going to add to the benefit or... Yes, yes. Not just the Win India. I'm not speaking about Win India. What's your take on women coming into the group practice? How is it going to add? How is it going to modify so, the? Madam, uh, we have we have women who are a part of a group. We have about three excellent. women medical oncologists currently working with us. One in South Bombay, one in Pune, one in Nashik, and they are fabulous. Maybe better than males, as they always are for various reasons. Thank so you. We close that. <laughs> thank with you. The... Thank you. Final authority that the women are much better in a group. They than... always have been. Thank you, Vashesh. You, you have been Thank brilliant. You. And I think it's a source of inspiration for all of us to sit together tomorrow morning for a session. Thank you, chairpersons.